Hey, y'all. Uh, we're going to get started just a hair early today because we do have a lot of stuff to get through, and I want to make sure we get through all of it before, because it'll be, since people have already taken the quiz, it's going to make it a lot more difficult to just, ultimately, we'll just get through stuff pretty quickly here. So I'm going to get through the reminders and stuff before we ever hit 1230, but if all fails, just ask me questions. Um, real quick, does anybody have any questions before we get started? All right. So just as a general reminder, obviously quiz six is due on Sunday at October 4th at 11.59 p.m. Y'all should know the kind of general general for this at this point. Um, exam two is next Friday. Don't forget that we're gonna be doing a review next Wednesday. Again, bring questions. If you're not willing to you know, talk about them in front of everybody, just send them to me ahead of time. Um, and we'll save the video for, obviously for posterity's sake. Um, but the big thing is, is if you don't bring me questions, I don't have things to answer and we'll just skip the review. Because honestly, that's kind of just a, I designed those days in just in case we run a little bit over on material. So, um, anybody have any questions about any of that kind of stuff before we get started? All right. So I did want to kind of go through this a little bit more formally, especially for those of y'all that have only been watching the lectures. Do remember that we have an extra credit opportunity for the second exam. It'll give you about 5% of your grade, so half a letter grade um, for exam two if you do these very simple things. You're gonna go out into the woods or just really walking around campus and you're gonna observe uh, 10, or 10 animals, plants, whatever. Five of them have to be animals and five of them have to be plants slash fungi. Uh, just because I don't want y'all to just go find a bunch of plants and call it a day. Um, the big important thing about that is, is you need to make sure that it's not a, a zoo animal, it's not a farm animal, it's not somebody's pet, it's not the well-planted garden. This needs to be wild stuff. This is really important because, well, yes, you're walking around campus and you see the squirrels and the hills and all that kind of stuff, and it's important to kind of know where all those things are. It doesn't help when you just throw the, the random crap in there too, because, it, you know, Ultimately, nobody cares if XYZ person had a pet leopard gecko and lived in that dorm for a year. You know, that doesn't really tell us about this the ecological system that's happening around us at UCA. That's why that is that way. Again, this is a really cool citizen science project that allows everyday people to just observe random wildlife and if you don't know what it is, it'll identify it for you or not. Um, and so you at least can get an idea of all these different flowering plants you see around you. There's so many different kinds of wildflowers that are just kind of growing up as weeds. And some of these flower beds and some of these, you know, lawns, and you can see some really cool stuff. Again, if you don't have to correctly identify anything, the app has an AI that's designed to help filter out what the picture is and at least get you in the right ballpark. And if it's not, there's people that'll go through and help kind of review it and get you in the right direction. So just make sure you're taking a good photo of it so that way it can actually be better identified. Or a good audio recording, how the way it works. Ultimately, you get the points. You can submit 10 observations to the project. Uh, UCF BSC 1005 2021. Then you're going to take a screenshot of your observations and submit it as a Word document uh, with your name on it, what your observations you did, that kind of thing. Just so I can be able to quickly read through and say, oh, here's your five animals, here's your five plants. You have until next Friday at 11 59 p.m. Okay? Yes. Do insects like earthworms count as animals? Yeah. Anything is an animal that's in that animal phylum, right? So as long as it's not a true plant or a fungi, you're good. Um, another general comment that I did want to make, um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but as an announcement on web courses, I went ahead and let y'all know that it is optional. There is an online option for this upcoming exam. I can only open it from like eight to three. So if you can't make those times work, you need to be here in person, all right? Um, it's through the Respondents browser, so it requires a webcam and it requires kind of a quieter place to be able to take it. I know the library has the ability to set that up for you, so maybe look into that if you're willing to. If you have access to SAS, I would almost do it through them, which will be a little bit easier. But if you would rather just take the, the test on or in person, that's fine by me. I've printed off about 100 copies. It should be plenty enough considering there's less than 100 people that actually show up to lecture these days. So just make a point to... If, if you really want to make sure that you're getting can do the uh, in person version, just let me know just ahead of time. But other than that, I'll just assume you're doing the online. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yes. 
So all you're literally doing is when you take that screenshot, it's coming out as a picture file, right? You're just going to post that picture file in a Word document and put your name in the Word document as like text. So if you look on the in on web courses in like the submission assignment thing that you used to like actually submit it, there's a downloadable option that has an exact example of this and exactly what I'm looking for. Yes. No, I'll have the scan drum for y'all. So it'll be exactly like last time. If you do decide to take it in person, there'll be me and Katie up here. We'll check your IDs, all that kind of fun stuff. So it'll be exactly like it has been. So any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so you said that you wanted to put another followers for this one. This should be a factor. Or it's another fun time. Oh. It's just so I, I would have, I was trying to set it up in the poll, but WebCourse is just stupid. So um, bear with me on that one. But honestly, again, there's like a hundred, I printed out a hundred copies. That should be plenty enough. I, I expect that I probably printed off like 90 extra more than I needed to. <laughs> yes. When we're doing the species thing, can mm -hmm. we say there's like squirrels and we have to say like Easter is great squirrel? So if you are only confident enough to say that it's just a squirrel, just say squirrel. <laughs> if you know it's an Eastern gray squirrel, go for it. Okay. So that, that's kind of how I would put it. Let if, if you're not 100% certain, let other people figure it out for you. I know that sounds a little bit uh, mean or something like that, like it, but it's easier just to fix it on the back end with, if you're not certain. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Like, just get it as close as you possibly can. It's okay to make mistakes. Like, this is all, you know, that's why they have that review process there. So just get it as close as you can. Awesome. Any other last minute questions? All right. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to dive back into uh, chapter 28 with the digestive and urinary tract stuff. Um, so where we left off was we had just been talking about the, um, so the actual digestive tract itself in the small intestine. So we're going to jump into exactly what the pancreas does here. So here the pancreas is designed to send pancreatic juices to the intestine, which are going to contain a bunch of different things. You have trypsin and cryptotrypsin, which break polypeptides and help break things down to that very simple, singular level. They're going to release amylase, which is there to help digest starch. Lipase, which is there to break down fat. Anything with ACE in it usually means it's cutting apart or breaking. Alkaline sodium bicarbonate, which is then going to neutralize any of the acid from the stomach that might have passed through. In addition to that, we've got the bile from the liver, which is going to help kind of break things down too. The liver produces a biochemical called bile that emulsifies fat into a small globule that then is allows it to mix with water. So remember, fat's nonpolar and water's polar, so you have to find a way to make it actually bind together. And gallbladder is going to store the bile and release it into the small intestine as it's needed. That's why, especially um, my little sister, for instance, had her gallbladder removed because it was just didn't work. And so as a result, she has to be very, very careful with the kinds of food she eats, particularly with fatty foods, like fried foods and stuff like that. She'll eat a single bite and she'll be sick for days. So it just kind of depends on how well your body can hold onto that bile and use it when it's needed. And ultimately by helping, the fix, uh, helping that fat mix with water, that bile is gonna allow for lipid digestion enzymes like lipases to work effectively. Now the small intestines is there is to digest most of the molecules. And that end products are then going to be used to build those macromolecules in the body cells. In other words, that small intestine is going to absorb all those very basic level sugars and amino acids and carbohydrates and all that kind of fun stuff. And then it's going to send it out to the cells and then the cells can rebuild it as they need it. Now the large intestine, which is immediately after the small intestine, is there to complete that final little bit of absorption. So the large intestines receives the chyme from the small intestines. That's that liquidy mass that had moved through your body at that point. And the lining of that large intestine also is there to absorb water, ions, and minerals from that chyme. So it's kind of pulling out whatever's left that it can. And ultimately, whatever is left from that process is then going to be eliminated as feces. Now, how exactly does the body obtain energy? Ultimately, that digestive system is going to provide steady supply of carbohydrates, protein, fat, water, minerals, and vitamins to replace those materials that leave the body. Again, they're doing that by breaking those things down mechanically and chemically, sending them through the small intestines where it absorbs most of the nutrients, the large intestines where it'll kind of absorb whatever's left, and finally gets rid of it. 
So what about nitrogenous waste? These are a little bit different, and the nitrogen that's given off in these nitrogenous waste is usually kind of a byproduct from things like cellular respiration. So while the digestive system is going to provide that energy and raw materials requirements for metabolism, all cells have to carry out metabolic reaction. And as they do, they're going to release waste into the bloodstream, and that's those nitrogenous waste that we were talking about. So excretion is the elimination of these metabolic wastes. This is primarily done through the urinary system. Now, these nitrogenous wastes come from protein. Why, if you've ever been really dehydrated, your pee tends to be a lot more like foamy and nasty looking and yellow. That's all that additional proteins and other crap that can be dissolved into water kind of building up. So inside the digestive tract, enzymes are going to break down these proteins into amino acids, and the cells are going to absorb whatever amino acids they can. Now, the other stuff is going to be excreted, usually in humans, as urea. Now, using, during cellular metabolism, these amino groups are stripped from their amino acids, forming things like ammonia. That ammonia is going to enter the bloodstream, and in mammals, we convert that ammonia to the waste molecule of urea, which is the next curated as urine. Now, something I do want to kind of point out is urea is very specific to the quote-unquote upper level um, vertebrates. So when you're looking at things, uh, fish in particular are going to use ammonia, which is a lot more caustic. But what's nice about ammonia is it requires it to be uh, water bound. And when you're a fish, right, you're living in water. So it's pretty easy to get rid of things through water. However, with urea and uric acid, you can reduce the amount of water needed to get rid of it. And so for instance, like this tortoise, right? This tortoise has to live out in the desert and does it, it has to hold on to every little bit of water it can. So what it excretes things as uric acid, which honestly can come out almost as like a little white precipitate. It's not really pee anymore. It's almost kind of like pebbles. It's really odd. Um, and as a result of that, it's preserving all of that water to be able to use for its own cellular processes. So basically, the more drought tolerant things are going to need to kind of more produce it as your very urea, or sorry, your acid. Things that have a little bit more access to water but aren't just completely immersed in it are probably going to just use classic urea versus your fish and things like that that are completely immersed in water entirely are usually going to use it as ammonia. Now, osmoregulation regulation is going to require the gain and loss of water and ions. And as a result, that's going to influence how much nitrogen weight you can get rid of. So if the cell environment is saltier than the cell outside, uh, outside of the cell itself, uh, the water is going to move out of the cell via osmosis. And in the opposite situation, if it's saltier inside the cell than out, water is going to move in based off of how that osmoregulation regulation works, right? Now, cells can use active transport to move ions against their concentration gradient from where they are less concentrated to where they are more concentrated. In other words, you can take that, even though you have a higher gradient of salt inside of the cell, you can still actively pump water or pump water out if you need that. Now this, osmo, this osmo regulation is going to balance this concentration in the body fluids. So animals in different environments have different adaptations for carrying out osmo regulation. So in other words, if you're in an environment that's extremely hot and dry and you need to keep as much water inside of you, even though your environment is much more salty and harsher, you can still use those active transport uh, elements of proteins and things like that that are in your cellular membrane to pump water in and keep it in, instead of letting it be just automatically diffused out. Now, ultimately, the urinary system has a number of different functions, including filtering the blood. It's going to eliminate those nitrogenous waste like we talked about. But it's also going to be there to help maintain that ion concentration of fluid uh, in your body. So in other words, it's going to help keep that osmoregulation regulation perfect. And then it's going to be there to help produce, store, and eliminate urine. So in other words, that last step of the nitrogenous waste cycle. Now the kidneys are the main excretory organ in this case. And as kidneys cleanse the blood, urine forms, which then travels through the ureter into the urinary bladder. And ultimately, your body's going to then release that urine through the urethra in some way, shape, or form. But again, there's also additional things <clears throat> inside of this. Things like the renal artery that's going to connect your uh, kidneys into your bloodstream or the adrenal glands, which are part of the pituitary uh, system, but help kind of regulate how much water loss happens, that sort of thing. Now, urine in humans and pretty much all of the vertebrates is a mixture of water, urea, toxins, and ions. So urine is formed as the kidneys are going to filter that urea, the glucose, ions, and other solutes from the blood. And ultimately, the kidneys are there to maintain that volume of blood by controlling the amount of water in urine. 
And so, of course, there's always several different types of tissues that make up the urinary system, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. And you don't need to know these that in depth, but just know that they all kind of play a different role and all combine together to form these different organ systems that we care about. So each tissue does play a certain role in eliminating urea, conserving water, regulating blood volume, and pH. Now, the big thing here is that the blood is going to ultimately be filtered through the kidneys. So the body's entire blood supply will flow through the kidneys, blood vessels over and over each day. It's like thousands of times a day. Um, and most of the fluid that the kidneys process is ultimately going to be reabsorbed into the blood and released or kept inside of your body. However, not all of that space, and you do have to release some of it to get rid of that urea. So it has to have some sort of mechanism of getting it out of your body, right? You need that to be dissolved in some sort of fluid so it can actually leave your body and not just sit there and build up. Now, the kidneys are made up of specialized cell groupings called nephrons. Now, these nephrons each contain blood vessels and uh, are all kind of like lining up against these blood vessels, rather which filter and help cleanse the blood. Basically, what happens is these nephrons are the functional units of the kidneys. The blood's going to come into these tubules, things are, sorry, they're going to come into the arteries and veins that come around these nephrons. They're going to interface with these nephrons, and these nephrons are going to pull out all those extra salts and ions and things that they don't need. And then that's going to be processed with all that water, and it's going to be kind of moved in and around and get rid of the stuff that you don't need while keeping the stuff that you do. Now, these nephrons do interact very closely with blood vessels. So each kidney receives blood from the renal artery, which branches into capillaries surrounding each nephron. And the kidney's capillaries eventually converge into the renal vein, which carry that cleansed blood out of the kidney. Each nephron is going to consist of a filter and a tubule. That filter is going to surround part of the capillary, and the fluid from the blood passes through that filter and ends up into the nephron's tubule. A collecting duct is then going to be there to receive that fluid from the several different neurons, or sorry, nephrons, and the urine from many collecting ducts are then going to empty up into the funnel like upper portion of the urine. So, and don't worry too much about all this extra detail. I don't think we put too much of that on the quiz or the test. Now, urine is formed in three basic steps. So, when it, you know, as your blood or your uh, body is filtering out the blood in your kidney, right? Uh, the filtration is going to begin as the blood pressure drives substances across those capillary walls into the nephrons. And those pores in that filter are going to allow water, urea, glucose, ions, and amino acids to pass. But large structures, such as plasma, proteins, blood cells, and platelets, are going to remain in the bloodstream. The useful substances are then going to be returned to the blood uh, from that nephron. So basically, they've got that reabsorption step. So first you're going to filter everything out, then you're going to keep what you need, and then you're going to get to the secretion step, which is where all those toxic substances, the ions, the drugs, all that kind of stuff are going to be secreted into the nephron to then ultimately be eliminated in urine. Those nephrons are going to go into those collecting ducts, and that's going to take everything down to that urinary bladder. Now ultimately, hormones are going to regulate all the kidney function. And like a lot of the different systems we've talked about, they use a very strongly negatively feed or negatively correlated feedback loop. In other words, if you want to increase something, you send signals to tell you to increase it. If you want to decrease something, you send signals to tell you to decrease it. It just, just continuously increase. Now, high levels of ADH or antidiuretic hormone are going to signal to the kidneys to decrease the amount of water loss. So higher ADH, less water loss. And then you're going to use aldosterone to promote the reabsorption of sodium ions into the bloodstream from nephrons, which is going to allow water to be kind of moved back in through osmosis. In other words, we're going to increase that salt concentration so water wants to move back towards the other way. Now, dialysis is a substitution for this filtration system. In other words, if your kidneys either stop working or are down to like 5 to 10% uh, functional capacity, this is what they'll do. So a dialysis machine is going to pump blood out of the patient's body past the semi-permeable membrane, and it'll basically act as a miniature or an artificial version of that nephron within inside your kidneys. Now, waste and toxins along with water are going to diffuse out of the blood, but unlike a nephron, a dialysis machine cannot help the body fully reabsorb all those useful nutrients. So again, this only really works so well 
is those are simple nutrient feed loss and invertment. Now there's two different kinds of dialysis. You have peritoneal, which is basically they're going to pump a fluid into your peritoneum, which is the area in between all of your lungs, your uh, primarily your digestive system. And that fluid is then going to absorb all those nutrients and excess crap that you don't need, and they'll pump it right back out. That usually takes three to four hours. Um, and basically, you're just sitting there waiting for it to pump in and pump out. Now, hemodialysis is kind of the classic version here that you're seeing. Basically, you're stuck sitting next to a machine for four and a half to six hours as blood comes in and comes out. It requires a specialized blood vessel port that you have to basically fuse together a bunch of the capillaries, and it's called a fistula. It's really funky if you ever feel one. You can feel vibrations because that's where you can feel like the heartbeat moving through. It's really creepy, it's a little bit odd. Yeah. It's complicated. So it depends on a couple of different factors. So, and, it, and honestly, what happens as a result of this, these kind of factors is if you're younger and you go on to dialysis, you're more likely to get off of it. <clears throat> But if you're older, you're, depending, especially if you're after the age of like 60, you're less likely to get what you need med medically wise to be able to come off the dialysis department. So unfortunately, I know way too much about this. Uh, my father uh, has major uh, kidney failure, um, has to for about four or five years. And so his particular situation, his kidneys just stopped functioning one day and they have been like five to 10% they just stopped. And when that happened, um, they immediately moved him to the peritoneal dialysis. They did that for a year or two, had a major um, staph infection that infected his intestinal organs and all that kind of fun stuff. So I switched him to the hemodialysis. You can do this at home or you can do this at a clinic. It's really sketchy when you do it at home because you have to get really comfortable with working with blood and needles and stuff like that. Really awkward and kind of terrifying, honestly, because if you fuck up, then you cover your entire living room with blood and you're calling the ER. So like knowing about this stuff is kind of critical, especially you have to go through this with families. It's awful. Uh, one thing I do want to really point out with this thing about how, especially when it comes to dialysis, it's just not as effective as regular um, your kidneys and that loss of all those extra nutrients that you normally would need. So my dad has permanent nerve damage through most of his body because for the longest time, they didn't realize that he was losing too much copper. And that small micronutrient, which you really don't think you need much of usually, um, because he was losing it at such a large rate, basically his nerves were not firing properly. And as a result, they kind of stopped firing correctly and completely. And so now, even though they fi fixed that problem, he's extremely unsteady and can't walk very well. So even it, there's a lot of these kind of weird side effects that can come from this. This is not a perfect solution. So avoid this as much as you possibly can. Anyways, yeah. It can. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the amount of proteins and stuff, right? So remember, the primary cause of that nitrogenous waste is a high amount of proteins that are then being broken down into amino acids, right? So the more meat you eat in particular, uh, the more likely you are to see kind of a little bit of a higher strain on your kidneys, as well as if you drink too much fluids. So if you just sit there and pound like, yay big of water, like three or four bottles in a day, it's too much. Your kidneys can't keep up with it. And so when it comes to particularly water poisoning, ultimately what happens is your body just can't keep up with the amount of water that you're adding into its system. And it causes um, where the cells will actually take up too much water and start bursting. It's really, there was a challenge, I think, way before TikTok ever existed. I think it was like back on Vine or something like that where a bunch of like high school kids were trying to pound and see how much water they could drink because they wanted to pretend like they were adults and, drink, and were drinking beer. And they drank like 20 or 30 like cups about yay big and two of the kids died from that just overabsorption of water. Yeah. How much water are you supposed to drink in a day? They estimate around eight, eight, um, eight cups of about eight fluid ounces. So total 64. Um, if you are out working out and being in the sun and sweating a lot, that's a little bit different. But ultimately what you're looking for, and this is gonna sound a little gross, but if your urine is like clear to slightly yellowish, that's where you wanna be. If it looks like you're peeing out coffee, you need to go to the doctor. <laughs> or any other color for that matter. Yes. Sorry? Yeah, try to get it as clear as possible. 
And the other thing you want to look for, just to generally gauge your health when it comes to, um, you know, the proteins and all that kind of buildup. And this is another sign to look for in case you might, especially with some of y'all being like right at your early 20s, you, you may want to keep an eye out for this because uh, it's usually when you'll detect type 1 diabetes that happens like at the outset or at the end of puberty. But basically, you want to keep an eye out for a lot of foaminess. What that foaminess in urine is, is carbohydrates and proteins. And what that's a sign is that you're either your pancreas isn't producing enough glu or, um, insulin, so you're not processing all of that glucose as well as you should, or you have, you're not being able to process those proteins, and so you need to check your uh, kidneys. So all this stuff does have practical applications, I promise. All right. Any other questions before we jump to the next system? Sorry to like bum y'all out with like dark stories, but I like to tell those stories because I think it's important for y'all to kind of have this stuff in context and understand why it's important to know these things. And that it can be pretty rough sometimes if you have these situations. So let's jump into my personal favorite system. That's the immune system. So pretty straightforward, the immune system's primary job is to prevent illness. So the immune system is a widespread, or widespread collection of a bunch of different cells and chemicals that are there to defend the body against infections, cancer, and other foreign substances. Now the immune system has several different components that all have to work together. You have the white blood cells, which include things like phagocytes, lymphocytes, and basophils. You have the lymphatic system, which includes things like lymph, lymph vessels, and lymph nodes that are going to move things around to produce that lymph itself. Then you have defensive proteins and chemicals, and a bunch of other different things as well because all of those white blood cells can be broken down into a bunch of different categories too. Now these white blood cells are gonna be the primary defender for your body. So there are three main types of white blood cells within your diverse function of your immune system. You have phagocytes, which are a couple different examples. You have macro cells, parasite activations, and neutrophils. And they're designed to eat and engulf bacteria and debris. Phago means eat, right? So phagocyte eating cell, where that comes from. Then you're going to get the lymphocyte. They're usually provide, or going to be produced in the lymph, so it's all that kind of fun stuff. Um, these are primarily the B, the T, and the natural killer cells. And these are going to be there to coordinate immune responses. So they're going to attack infected or cancer cells, and they're usually going to be involved with what we call the adaptive or the, the memory immune system. And finally, you're going to get things like basophils, which are there pretty much just to trigger inflation or uh, inflammation. Now these phagocytes are scavenger cells. Most white blood cells are in healthy immune systems are phagocytes, and they're going to be there to locate foreign particles as well as other cells and consume them through phagocytosis, eating of cells. Those B and T cells are going to be there to record and provide response to specific pathogens. And those active killer cells are kind of like the preemptive version of an adaptive immune response. So, like if you were to think of it as an evolutionary perspective, you have those more basic white blood cells the natural killer cells, and then you have your B and T cells, as far as like how they less derived to more derived. And finally, those basophils, which are there to trigger inflammation. These are the least common white blood cells, and they circulate through the blood, releasing chemical signals to trigger inflammation, particularly in response to allergies. Uh, MASH cell cells are going to share very similar functions, but do not circulate within the blood like that. Now, the lymphatic system is there to produce and store those defense cells. So you have the lymphoid organs, which include things like the spleen, the thymus, and the bone marrow. And we'll get into those a little bit more here in a second. And then you have the other aspects of the lymph system, which is there to transport those defense cells. So it, that's all done through the lymph, which is kind of like a, it's similar to the blood, but not as pressurized. It just kind of moves around a little more slowly. And that's going to move through these lymph capillaries, which are very similar to those uh, all those different blood vessels and veins and arteries that we talked about. Those lymph capillaries are going to be there to absorb any interstitial fluid and as well to deliver all those lymph vessels to where they need to go. That lymphatic system is also going to help filter out foreign substances. So lymph is going to also pass through what we call the lymph nodes, which is there to remove any foreign substances that might show up in the lymph. And each lymph node contains millions of all these lymphocytes that are going to be there to attack any foreign substance. So if you've ever been to the doctor and they're feeling your neck, right? What they're looking for is the, the uh, lymph nodes that are along your neck. And they're trying to see if they're swollen. Because if they're swollen, they might be responding to some sort of infection that you have. 
That's why they look for those kinds of things. Ultimately, the immune system, at least in vertebrates, has two primary subdivisions. You have the innate defenses, which are there to provide defense against any pathogen, but they're not as strong and they tend to be um, a little bit slower. And then you have the adaptive immunity, which is where immune cells recognize and remember specific pathogens and attack them with a huge amount of uh, speed and dust. So basically, they're going to destroy things really quickly. Now, in a lot of other organisms, particularly other animals outside of vertebrates, they only have that innate defense. But an innate defense is extremely strong, too. And if, especially if you're not a long lived organism, just having an innate defense is plenty. Whereas things like us, tortoises, a lot of these more long lived creatures, you're going to be exposed to the same pathogen over and over and over again. So it may be more beneficial to have that adaptive immunity. And one thing to keep in mind with these two different systems, the innate system requires a lot less energy and a lot less nutrients and resources, whereas your adaptive immunity is constantly just sucking up a ton of energy and resources that you could be used to grow, to reproduce, basically to continue on your line quickly. Now these innate defenses are immediate and non-specific. So you have physical and chemical barriers that form the first line of defense. They're gonna block pathogens and foreign substances from entering the body. And you've got the medicine things like skin, uh, which is you know pretty effective in keeping things on the inside of you inside and the things on the outside of you outside, unless you know you get stabbed or something. Um, you have things like mucus, which are there to protect all of your um, respiratory and digestive systems and keep you know the nastier bugs outside of it. Things like earwax, which are help to keep you know infections outside of your ears and not to get into the internal part of your ear mechanism and damage that. Ears, which are going to keep things out of your eyes, little stomach acid, which is there to basically fry anything that shows up in your stomach. Now, the skin in particular is an amazing external innate defense, and it has two layers. You have the epidermis, which is the outermost physical barrier. That's going to be there to protect the body from the exterior of many layers of dead or dry cells. And then you're going to have the dermis, which is this layer underneath here, that's going to be below the epidermis. It has nerve endings, sweat glands, oil glands, and blood vessels. In other words, that's where you're going to have actually the important stuff that you need to use to um, keep your homeostasis where it needs to be. Now, a bunch of different cell types are going to participate in this internal innate defense. So once you've got past all these external features that your body has, your body has a bunch of internal features as well to keep you safe. You're going to have the macrophages, which are there to consume pathogens and promote things like fever which you know fever is something your body does to respond to your pathogen it's not something that's usually triggered by the pathogen itself you're going to have active killer cells which are there to destroy body cells that have become cancerous or infected with a virus and then you're going to have things like basic cells which are there to provoke inflammation by releasing histamine so obviously you've probably taken an antihistamine before all that swelling and all that stuff that's associated with having an allergic reaction particularly a very strong allergic reaction, is caused by an overabundance of histamine. That's why you take an antihistamine. And if it gets too bad, that's why you have to use things like your uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine to actually control the reaction, because you need to basically send your body into shock just to get rid of it. Now, also in addition to the cells itself, you have a bunch of specific proteins that are going to help with um, participating in that internal innate defense. And so you're going to have white blood cells that are going to be there to produce these complement proteins. These complement proteins basically are designed to bind to the outside of bacterial cells and puncture them, which opens them up to damage. And once you puncture them, they can usually be killed off. Additionally, you have things like cytokines, which are proteins that cause a rise in the body's temperature called fever. And that high temperature is going to indirectly counter microbial growth. Kind of think back to, we've talked about a couple of times where your body kind of wants to be at a particular temperature because it needs to be able to have all those different um, chemical reactions to, to kind of fuel cellular respiration and all that stuff. They have to be at certain temperatures for that stuff to work. And if you're outside of that temperature, it means you can't grow as quickly, you can't reproduce as quickly. And so that's why you have fevers that show up the way they do. Even that just slight difference from 98 to 100 can completely change how your body reacts and how those uh, bacterial cells are able to colonize your body. 
Inflammation involves also an internal innate defense. Inflammation is the immediate response that it recruits uh, white blood cells to an area, and this helps to clear debris as well as create an environment hostile to microbes. Unfortunately, it can also be, it tends to be a positive feedback loop. So if you get inflammation a lot, it's going to increase and increase and increase. So you have to be very careful to, or at least your body does, I should say, to kind of use it sparingly. Ultimately, the cystamine is going to dilate the blood vessels, allowing these things to leak in. The uh, damage cells are basically going to release that substance that's going to provoke those uh, basophils and those mast cells in the skin dermis to release that histamine. That histamine is going to dilate those blood vessels, allowing all that blood and stuff to leak in, all those white blood cells. That leaked blood plasma is going to cause swelling and pain. And that's where your, all your macrophages and all your other white blood cell types are going to move into that area, engulfing and destroying bacteria and damaged cells. And usually with acute inflammation, it's really quick and usually only kind of focusing around one specific area, uh, particularly with injury. Right? So for instance, if you've got the splinter, right? You've got a splinter that comes in, it releases the histamine, it floods that area with the excess blood, and you can see where all these bacteria cells that came off of that splinter are getting attacked. And ultimately, it's going to remove the to kill it off. Let's jump into the adaptive immunity. Now, these are here to target specific pathogens. So this is actually what I study a lot. Adaptive immune response acts against individual targets, and you have two different types. You have the B cells and the T cells, which are there to provide ammunition to these precision defenses. In other words, these different types of cells are there to either recognize or recognize and attack the particular pathogens that they find in your body, both internally and externally in your cells. So for instance, if you have a virus that's taken over a cell, it's going to recognize based off of the kinds of proteins that are showing up on the outside of that cellular membrane, hey, the cell is infected, I need to kill it. Now, these proteins that I was talking about that kind of trigger these responses, those are called antigens. Now, antigens are molecules on the surface of the bacteria or virus or any other invader of the body, and they're gonna be there to stimulate that immune reaction by the B and T cells. It's, kind of, it's one of those things too, where pretty much anything that stimulates that reaction is considered an antigen, so any of those proteins. Now, antibodies are then going to bind to those antigens. And these are Y-shaped, and they're produced by the immune system. And these are what's going to bind to those specific antigens. And one thing I want to point out is the reason why you can have such a strong different uh, impact of all these very specific different uh, pathogens is because if you notice, these antibodies that are binding to these antigens have a very specific functional shape that bind to the proteins at that very specific location. And so understanding the general shape and how those shapes are, are materialized in an antibody can really help you understand how your immune system can respond to something. We'll get to that in a little bit. So these macrophages are going to be there to trigger two different types of adaptive immunity. You have cell-mediated immunity, which is where T cells are going to kill the body cells that are defective or have been infected by a pathogen. And then you're going to have humoral immunity which is where the B cells are gonna remember and secrete antibodies where these antigens are to ever reappear. Ultimately, these macrophages are going to engulf the invaders and sa uh, save their antigens for later. In other words, you're going to kind of figure out what this thing is and then keep around that little bit of information in the form of a protein so that way you can respond to it later on down the road. Antigens from bacterium or another form of the body are gonna be attached to the proteins on the surface of the macrophage. And this is how that immune system is then going to be able to recognize these same antigens in the future. And your body goes through a lot of different processes to basically make those specific kinds of cells now that they know that that antigen exists in the wild and it's dangerous. They'll go through a whole process where they make thousands and thousands and thousands of them initially, let them die off. And then if they ever detect it again, it'll immediately ramp back up again. Now, those macrophages are then going to display that antigen on the surface, tra uh, travels through that lymphatic system to a lymph node, which is full of all these lymphocytes, so those B and T cells. And that antigen on the macrophage is going to bind to the receptors on those helper T cells. And this binding is going to activate that helper T cell to start replicating. Now, these helper T cells are the master cells of the immune system. In the sense that they're kind of like, um, if you've ever been to a locksmith before and you've ever had to get like a master key, that's what this is essentially. 
and because they initiate and coordinate those adaptive immune responses. And when activated by the antigen, they're going to begin to massively replicate. This is where the actual memory part of that, you know, adaptive or memory-based immune system comes from. Now, these memory and effective T cells are going to play different roles in the adaptive immune system. Uh, so the memory cells are going to be there to able to launch a quick immune response if the antigen if ever enters the body again. In other words, they remember that antigen from previous times. Whereas the effective T cells are going to help immediately because they're going to release cytokines that are going to help activate and enhance that cell mediated and humoral responses. In other words, they're just going to put out a lot of chemicals that are going to help kill off that antigen or that pathogen as quickly as possible. Now, cytokines are there to initiate that cell mediated and humoral immune response. So these cytokines are messenger proteins that are going to bind to immune cells and alter their activity. Basically, it's very similar to a neurotransmitter in a nerve cell. It gets that signal and says, I need to do this. These white blood cells, such as the effector T uh, help cells, are going to release interleukins, and that's the largest group of cytokines. And there's literally thousands and thousands of different cytokines. I'm not going to expect y'all to know that much detail on this. Ultimately, these cytokines are going to activate the cytotoxic T cells, which means cell killing T cells. Um, and these, that's going to then cause that whole cell immune response. Ultimately, the cytokines are going to bind to the receptor, express in those cytotoxic T cells. These are going to cause these attack cells that then recognize the invader cells that have that antigen. And those activated cytotoxic T cells are going to bind to and destroy those antigen bearing cells. So, how exactly do these cytotoxic T cells attack and destroy? So these T cells are going to bind to the antigens on the bacteria, cancer cells, or virus infected cells, and they release toxic chemicals that kill the cell. You can actually see how this works. You got the cytotoxic T cell. It's been activated based on those T helper cells, and all cytokines are telling to attack something. It's going to bind that antigen on that cancer cell. They're going to release all these toxic chemicals that are going to attack that cell membrane and ultimately kill the cell. So these cytokines are going to also activate B cells and the humoral response as well. But again, ultimately, all of this is being triggered by those antibodies that are those main weapons of that humoral immunity. Those antibodies are going to bind to those antigens and tell all these different cells to do what they need to do. Now, remember, again, that these antibodies recognize and bind to antigens based off of what's showing up in this variable region called the peptide binding region. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And thus, once you've triggered these B cells to be activated, they're going to undergo this clonal selection. Again, you don't need to know that much detail on this stuff. Just know that it exists and how it works in a general sense. Ultimately, this humoral immunity is both active or passive. In other words, like your body can ramp up to increase the amount of humoral uh, immunity that you need, depending on certain circumstances, or it could just be there present in your body system. But either way, it's going to produce a lot of energy required to keep this thing functioning. Ultimately, when all of those cells are done and dead, you then have that adaptive immunity, which is there, going to be there to remember those antigens again. Now, this is kind of important. So the primary response can be initially pretty slow when it comes to adaptive immune systems. So if you look, Here's that first exposure to antigen X, or whatever we're going to call it. And here's that primary response to antigen X. It builds up really quickly, but relatively slowly compared to when it's going to be encountered again. Say, for instance, you find here, your adaptive immune response is going to kick in. It usually takes a little bit longer, weeks time frame. But say, for instance, you get exposed to it again a couple weeks later. Notice it's immediately up here as far as the total antibody concentration, only a week or two later. Instead of taking three or four weeks to reach that peak at a much lower level. Does that make sense? Ultimately, that second immune, immune response is going to be much stronger and much faster. And that allows you to handle those pathogens that are particularly nastier, especially if you want to be a long lived organism. Ultimately, thanks to those memory cells, that's what gives that, that much faster response time at the second. Exposure to something. Yeah. Does that continue to increase on tertiary and quaternary exposures? It depends. 
Um, so ultimately it will max out at some point, but especially if you're exposed to something over and over and over again, um, unless that antigen changes at any point, you're gonna respond to it pretty effectively every single time from that point on. Um, and that's usually how you can develop things like vaccines and stuff, because if you expose something to you constantly over and over for a couple uh, years in a row, that's what's gonna allow you to build up that actual immunity response and be able to deal with it. Now, in order to get all those very hyper-specific uh, antigen binding sites, right, on those antibodies that allow you to detect those specific pathogens, you need a ton of different things to help you. Because obviously you have to have all these different proteins in the right ways and shapes and just hope that they bind. It's not like they know, hey, this one is going to work for something that I've never encountered before. And so ultimately what happens is you have specialized genes that encode for antibodies that are going to contain hundreds of small DNA segments. And these genes are often replicated two or three times in the genome. So you might have three or four different copies of a single gene that all these different alleles, if they're different, are going to give you a slightly different combination pattern for this. Now, these segments are then rearranged in developing lymphocytes. And it basically allows them to kind of, depending on the circumstances, it's almost kind of like a game of Plinko where you drop the little peg down at the top and it kind of goes into like one of eight different options. So you're starting with like four different alleles and then branch out to 32 different options and then they develop even further from that. And that, that further development over and over and over again is what gives you all these different kinds of antigen binding sites. And then you're gonna have that clonal deletion step which is gonna stop our immune systems from attacking any of our own cells. Because obviously if we have an antigen binding site that's going to bind to something that we have just normally in our body, we're gonna to wanna to kill it. Because if it starts attacking ourselves, it can kill us, right? That's when you, and that's one of the issues you can have with your immune system if it's not working right, is it can attack your own cells and start hurting you pretty dip, pretty badly. Now vaccines are there to jumpstart this immunity. Ultimately a vaccine exists by stimulating an active immunity against the pathogen without causing illness. There's a couple of ways you can do this. Obviously probably the classic way of doing this is either taking an inactivated or a dead virus or bacteria, whatever and injecting that into your body to stimulate that primary immune response. And by having those dead or dying cells there that can't really do anything, but that your body can respond to, it gives you your body that memory and can respond to it later when you actually come across the real thing. Things like um, cowpox and smallpox. Cowpox was a lot less deadly for humans, but those that were infected with it were much more able, able to survive smallpox infections. And so that's one of the reasons why Europeans in particular especially those that were around cows, had more of a natural immune response to that. And ultimately we learned just through trial and error that if you expose people to that smallpox or that cowpox early, it keeps them from dying from smallpox later on down in life. Now these vaccines are there to teach the immune system to recognize those invaders. So that's basically jump starting and getting us to that secondary immune response. Now the other one type that is very recent that I do want to mention is you have mRNA virus or vaccines. What that does, instead of in, in, you know, introducing a dead virus or a dead bacterial cell, you take just the antigen and you transcribe it as an RNA particle into a protein and you put that in your body. And that's what your body's recognizing. You're not, so for instance, with the COVID-19 vaccine, you're not actually putting any COVID-19 in your body. You're taking the mRNA that codes for just that antigen and giving it to your immune cells to be able to respond to it. That's one of the reasons why it may not be as effective initially, but if you have multiple back or multiple doses over and over again, that's what's going to ultimately get you to that second and tertiary uh, immune response. Ultimately, these antigens and vaccines take several different forms as well, and we've kind of already talked about those. But the big thing I do want to point out is that vaccines can't prevent all infectious diseases, and there are some in particular that target immune cells that may be able to totally evade um, your immune system in general. Things like HIV and AIDS, which is itself an HIV, the reason why it's so nasty and why it's so hard to get rid of is because it's attacking those immune cells and it's keeping you from being able to build that response to it. And hopefully things like mRNA vaccines can actually help to deal with that kind of stuff down the line. The flu vaccines in particular can also be kind of complicated because we have to have such a lead time ahead and just kind of guess what 
kind of flu is going to show up this year. Like every year you hear H5N1 or H1N1. All those are different kinds of combinations. And at each H and each um, N, there's like five or six different combinations, plus an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or a bunch of other things. So in other words, if you have to kind of just predict what you think is showing up in one part of the world, it's going to show up in other parts. Now, something I do want to briefly mention is you do have autoimmune disorders, which is where your immune system is then going to start attacking your own system. And there's a couple different examples of this, and it's usually caused by clonal deletion fails. And that could be both a genetic thing, or it could be just a weird developmental thing that happens. For instance, type 1 diabetes occurs when your antibodies attack insulin producing cells in the pancreas, and arthritis is caused by the autoimmune attacks on those cells that line that skeletal joint and break that down over time and increase the, the friction in between all your bone cells. Now, immunodeficiencies can also lead to opportunistic infections. So like we've talked about, or like we've mentioned with HIV, if you have a weakened immune system, other things can then colonize your immune system and cause damage. So for instance, people with immunodeficiencies are gonna be much more vulnerable to opportunistic pathogens, particularly funguses that we in the uh, more westernized world usually don't deal with as much. People that have those more immunocompromised systems, whether it be through organ transplant where you're artificially suppressing it or through other means, are going to have to deal with that. And again, HIV is a classic example of this because it targets those helper T cells. It's going to cause immunosuppression. In addition to immunosuppression, you also have allergies, which are a misdirect of the immune response. We've kind of talked about this a little bit. It's basically where your immune systems respond more than they should, essentially. And that's kind of a rough way to put it, because there's a little bit of semantics behind that. But ultimately, it's when your, your B and your T cells react to, say, pollen or something like that more than they should and treat it as a foreign invader. And they cause massive inflammation and all that kind of fun stuff. And as a result, you're sitting there taking Benadryl every day. And ultimately, these allergies are going to launch exaggerated attacks. So if you're, say, for instance, uh, allergic to shellfish, there's some protein in shellfish that triggers that and it becomes problematic. So one thing I do want to mention really quickly, because it will be on your place for sure, is that here at UCF, we look at how the amphibian immune system can kind of play a role in this in particular. One, because amphibians are kind of like that basal lineage of vertebrates on land, right? But two, what you learn here can be really valuable in humans. And finally, three, Amphibians, particularly frogs, are the worst hit group of species on the, on the, in the world when it comes to like pathogens and all that kind of fun stuff. For instance, a single disease has caused 10% of all frog extinctions globally, as well as 25% of species declines as a direct result of that single pathogen. Not you know, climate change, not you know, habitat destruction, not any of that. So what we do is we look at this major histocompatibility complex which is associated with the antigen recognizing centers of your body. In other words, that's what's going to code those antibodies. And we look at class two, which is responsible for looking at things that are outside of a particular cell. And in our case, we have a particular pathogen I study called Perkinsia. It's a protist that kind of works like the um, alien from the movie Aliens, where it kind of goes into your body, eats through your liver, and then bursts out killing you. Really kind of gruesome. But we don't know anything about this thing and we need to know how the body is going to respond to it. So here's just a quick rundown of what Perkinsia is. You can read through it in more detail, but just know that I study it. That might pop up later. And finally, our goal is to just simply like look at all this different real gene diversity and see if we can find out if there were situations where animals that were able to live and deal with these kinds of infections were able to survive better based off of the kind of alleles they had at that particular gene. And so we're still kind of figuring things out, but there's a lot of different reasons why this might be useful, at least in these populations. So definitely take a look at it. All this information is on, up on web courses, but you do just need to know what we study and why we study it. All right. Quiz six is due on Sunday, October 4th at 11.59 p.m. Exam two is next Friday. Make sure you're there for it if you want to take it in person. If not, it's online. And then don't forget about the review.